I have with me one of my friends, Perry Marshall. Uh, Perry and I actually met going to church years ago. I think that was the first time we met. Perry's an engineer, and he's going to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the books and some of his background. But um, tell us what he'd like to share with us. Well, good afternoon. It's great to be at Notre Dame and the Fighting Irish. Thank you for having me. Um, this is going to be very interesting today because um, uh, it, from what I can tell, all y'all or almost all y'all are involved in some kind of a business doing something and trying to solve problems which um, sometimes seem like nobody's ever tried to solve them before and maybe they haven't. But I have a really unusual proposition for you is that um, all the problems you're trying to solve right now already got solved somewhere sometime by Mother Nature and you just never really thought to go look there. And, um, and so I'm talking about evolving your business by stealing innovations from the greatest source. And by the way, the innovations are neither copyrighted, trademarked, or patented, so they're free for the taking. Um, so just so you know who I am, um, I, I'm author of these six books. Um, uh, Ultimate Guide to Google AdWords is the world's best-selling book on Internet advertising, and Google, uh, AdWords is Google's adver advertising platform. I wrote the first version of that in 2003, and it's sold about 100,000 copies now. Ultimate Guide to Facebook Advertising is the leading book on Facebook advertising in the bookstores. Um, there, there's also a local business book, uh, a book on, called 8020 Sales and Marketing, which is about the Pareto Principle, an industrial Ethernet book, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit, and an evolution book, which is a science book. But I'm actually taking the science stuff and applying it to business, and I've been doing this for years in my business and in my consulting work. I've consulted with hundreds or maybe thousands of companies over the last 15 years. And um, so what, here's what we're going to do today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a story um, uh, for the, about the first 20 minutes, which is a science collides with religion story. Okay, And then I'm going to show you some things that I discovered from Mother Nature that uh, none of the usual kind of evolution books we're talking about that, that is extremely useful. And then at the end, um, we'll do some group exercises and we'll do some Q&A. Um, and I think you're going to find this all very interesting. Um, and, uh, and, and so, so when I was 14 years old, I, I grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska. I, my dad was a minister. Um, I grew up in this extremely conservative Protestant evangelical church with, you know, a lot of rules and stuff. And, um, and they had this special speaker when I was 14 years old. And um, he was, uh, his name was John Whitcomb, and he was one of the leaders of the Young Earth Creation Movement. And uh, he, he came for a whole week, like every night he would, there would be another lecture and, and I thought it was great because I've been a science geek like as long as I can remember and, um, and he gave this whole explanation about how all of the geology of the earth and everything can all be explained by Noah's flood in 40 days and 40 nights and, and I thought it was great. Right, the super, super literal interpretation of Genesis, and like he just explains everything. All right, awesome. Um, well, time goes by, and little by little, you start to figure out, mm, the story doesn't really add up very well, right? Like, okay, so if the universe is 6,000 years old, how come I can see a star that's 100 million light years away and like, when did the light leave the star? And, you know, and if, if you can see objects 100 million light years away now, but they were only made 6,000 years ago, then that means, like, the rest of the Earth's history is all fake. So that means God is, like, doing this. That means science is the study of an illusion. You, you, you get the idea, right? Like, this doesn't actually work too well. Well, um... 
I, this never turned into a crisis, but it certainly was one of these little things that kind of nags at the back of your head, right? And then, you know, other things. And, well, then I got an electrical engineering degree, okay? And, and in electrical engineering, like, you really learn about the speed of light. And I measured it in a physics lab. And you know, it's like, yeah, we really, and, and then you, know, you also learn the math. Right, you learn that it's all extremely interconnected, right? And if like if somebody goes, oh well, see the speed of light is just slowing down, see, and 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 they're like, no, 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 that would make a complete mess of physics, which actually works really well. So that's not it. You get the idea, right? So anyway, fast forward a few years, and I heard a, a talk by a guy named Hugh Ross, and this was in the mid '90s, and Hugh Ross was an astrophysicist who's also a Christian, and he said, he, he, he explained all about the Big Bang. One, one of the things that he explained about the Big Bang, which uh, seems, as far as we can tell, seems to be about 13 billion years ago, he, he said that there's all of these constants, like uh, the, the mass of a proton, the mass of a neutron, the charge of an electron, the strength of gravity, the expansion rate of the Big Bang. And if all of these things were on dials, and if you messed with any of the dials at all, you'd get a complete disaster. Like you might not, you could mess with one of those, for example, one of the dials is the expansion rate of the Big Bang. And if you messed with the expansion rate of the Big Bang by 0.000000001% with 120 zeros, then the universe would either spray out like a mist and never even gather, collect into stars, or if it was too little by the same amount, it would collapse back in on itself and just have a big crunch. Um, and, and, and so what I found out was we live in an exquisitely fine-tuned universe. Um, and, and that the, the fact that we have all of these elements and how elements come from stars crashing together, and this is why you get heavy elements like lead and gold and heavy metals and stuff, it was like, wow, that is way more amazing than anything the Noah's Ark guy was ever talking about, okay? And it makes sense, right? You know, and, 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 and Hugh Ross said, well, and isn't it interesting that the opening verse of the Bible is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He goes, so they were talking about this 4,000 years ago. I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. So what happened was, I traded my young earth creationism for a fine-tuned universe, which was really much more amazing than the story where we're trying to cram this thing into a preconceived framework. All right, great. I, I thought that was very cool. Well, all right. Then, fast forward uh, maybe 10 years, and I go to visit my brother in China. Now, my brother, my brother had trod this really super conservative path. He had stayed on the path that we grew up in, okay? I had kind of drifted into a more exploratory kind of uh, way of looking at the world. Still, I was still Christian for sure, but... Um, but Brian is definitely, you know, like with the old camp. Well, so he got a master's degree in theology, and he moved to China. And in China, he's teaching English, and he's doing missionary work on the side. And in four years, he went from hardcore right-wing conservative Christian to almost atheist. And now he's like almost an atheist, and I go visit him. And we're in this bus, if you could call that a bus, that is a bus. In China, that's a bus. And um, we're having this argument. And, like, this is not going well. Okay? And you haven't had a theological argument until you've had it with a guy who knows Greek and Hebrew and has spent five years in a conservative seminary, knows where all the bones are buried, knows the stuff better than you do, and he's tearing the whole thing apart. And so he's kind of dragging me against my will. Well, being an electrical engineer, I found myself um, retreating to what I know best, which is science. Because when you do any profession, you know that you know that you know certain things. And so I said to him, Brian, okay, look at the hand at the end of your arm. I said, this is a fine, 
fine piece of engineering. Like, really good. Take it from an engineer. I said, you don't think this is an accumulation of random accidents, do you? And he goes, hold on! And he just comes right back at me with this whole thing about, hey man, you don't need a designer. You just need millions and millions of years and millions and millions of creatures and every now and then there's a copying error and every now and then one of those is better and then it outstrips the other ones and, it, and you get continuous improvement, you know, uh, for millions of years and you do get hands at the end of your arm. You don't need a designer and all the scientists know that and that's just a bunch of, you know, obsolete creationist like nut jobbery. Um, and I, I listened to that and I said, okay, like I'm trying to think like 16 chess moves ahead. Okay. Cause he is very, very smart. And I thought, okay, I'm not sure I buy that story as an engineer. It doesn't actually make sense. However, I'm not a biologist and I know a whole <coughs> bunch of biologists would agree with him and not me. And I know that science is very weird and very counterintuitive sometimes, and he might be right. And so instead of arguing with him, I kind of shoved it down and I made, I made a decision. I said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into this and I'm going to find out. And I'm going to let science make this decision for me because I know that I know that I know that I know certain things. And I'm an electrical engineer, I am technically literate, I can open a scientific paper, I can read it, I can figure it out, here we go. And I leapt into the void. And it was kind of scary, like, I don't know where this is going to take me. I might be an atheist too, by the time this is done, you know. Maybe he and I were going to go to Thanksgiving dinner, and everybody's going to pray their invisible sky daddy, and we're going to be looking at each other like... <laughs> Yeah, you know, we all figured this out. You know, like, the gig is up, but they just don't know it yet. We're smarter than them. Or maybe we spend the whole football game arguing with all the other family members. I mean, I don't know how this is going to turn out. You know, maybe my wife is going to take the kids to Sunday school, and I'm not going to go. I don't know. But here we go. So I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur. Most entrepreneurs are obsessive personalities. I'm obsessing about this. I'm buying books like crazy. I'm sure Amazon stock is probably going up. I'm going to websites. I'm just piling up all this knowledge and and it was extremely confusing okay I mean it was like this ping pong ball thing like you read you read the stuff on this side and then you read the stuff on this side and like and you're trying to decide like you know and sometimes they both make sense and then it's like man he really trashed those people and then you go over here man he really trashed those people and and I said there's got to be a better way to figure this out than just watching the ping pong ball go back and forth. Um, there, ha there must be a way where I can like touch the bottom of the swimming pool, grab onto something really solid, and then start working from there and actually sort this out. So um, what happened, uh, so, and, I, and I made a decision. I said, I am going to ignore no verifiable fact. If I, as a, as a scientifically literate person, can reasonably verify that something, as far as we can tell, is really true, then I'm going to put it up on the chalkboard and I'm not going to ignore it. And I'm going to keep putting stuff on the chalkboard until I can somehow try to make sense of this whole thing. Well, one day I had this huge epiphany. And I was trying to figure out, okay, so if the falcons are flying around, and Brian says the falcons have copying errors sometimes are going to be better and then there's a good mutation and then the eye sees better and then it hunts better and then it beats the other falcons is that really true can that really happen how does that work and i was trying to understand how does dna work what is a dna mutation and one day i had this giant epiphany and i this was totally unexpected i did not see this coming but two years before i had written this book it's called industrial ethernet um, now, this is the third edition. Uh, it sells on Amazon for $89, and it, for $89, it's probably the best sleeping aid that you could buy, okay? If you want to know how an Ethernet packet is put together, this book will tell you, okay? 
Um, and I wrote it for the world's largest professional society of process control engineers, which is called the ISA. And this was in a previous life when I was selling industrial networking equipment. Now, you know, I joke about it being boring. It's actually really interesting if you're geeky enough to appreciate it. Uh, the fact that you can drive down the expressway, uh, hopefully your spouse is driving while you're on the iPad watching the YouTube video. But the fact that, the fact that you know, you could stream video in a car while you're going 75 miles an hour, does anybody have any idea how much electrical noise there is in a car? Okay, the fact that this actually works is just a gigantic freaking miracle. Okay, and I understand all of the cool little things that they do to make sure that these packets go back and forth correctly. And that, and it, it has to happen, a like, you have to get the data 100% correctly. Like, if you only get 98% of the data, the cell phone drops, okay? It's very, fra it's very fragile, okay? And, uh, and, and, and so I'm studying DNA, and all of a sudden, here's what I realize. I'm showing you a picture. So this is what an Ethernet packet looks like, okay? It's like a big, long string of ones and zeros, and, and then you can slice it into these different pieces, and they all have these different jobs, okay? It's like the rules of grammar, like, well, verbs do this, and nouns do this, and adjectives do this. Well, Ethernet packets are broken up in the same sort of way, and it's basically messages inside of messages inside of messages. Now, this is a, this is a strand of DNA that codes for protein. Now, does this look eerily similar to this? I was like, oh my word, I understand this. I totally understand this. This is digital data. This is digital code. And it is. There's a whole field in biology called bioinformatics, and it's based on the extreme, exquisite similarity between these two things. In fact, they're mathematically identical. They're both digital code. And there's encoding and there's decoding. Every time a cell replicates in your body, it's no different than your computer reading in, uh, an Ethernet packet and, sh and putting an email in front of you. It's the same basic process. Now, there's more than that going on in a cell, but there's not less. Okay? I'm like, oh! I can, I can understand this. Guess what? Evolution is a software engineering problem. We can figure this out. There's a book uh, from about 10 years ago called Evolution as Computation. Okay? Evolution is a computational problem. And here's what it's not. It's not accidental copying error. You can take that, you can write it in blood and take it to the bank. Evolution does not happen because one falcon had a DNA copying error and that accidentally made it better. That never works. Okay? Now, what I did find out was really interesting. So, you had this parallel. Well, then I had this question. So, well, so, all right, so how does this evolution stuff work? Now, now, backing up to what I showed you here, if I had gotten this far in my investigation and I hadn't gone any farther, based on what I knew as a communications engineer, I would have decided that evolution didn't happen. Because there was something I didn't know. Okay, and, and in fact, I asked my, here, here's, what, here's a question I asked myself. I said, I was in engineering school for five and a half years and nowhere at any point in any of my courses, I, I, I specialize in communication systems and control systems and we studied all these ways of optimizing systems. And you guys do your own, in this class, you, you study your own particular ways of optimizing systems too, okay? And I said, so we had PID loops and we had all these different things. Nowhere in any of those classes did they say, you make millions of copies, you add copying errors to a whole lot of them, you let natural selection sort them out, and then you pick the best one. That was never in any of my engineering classes. 
And I thought, well, either the biologists know something the engineers don't know, or the engineers know something that the biologists know, don't know. I don't know what it is. Now again, I, I almost came to the premature conclusion that evolution was some kind of a hoax or, or something based on what I just told you, but there was something else, and here's what it was. I, I, kept, I kept searching. I kept looking. I wasn't really content that I had this figured out because I saw a lot of anecdotal uh, and circumstantial evidence that would support an evolutionary story. And about two years into this, I discovered this lady. This is Barbara McClintock. How many of you have ever heard of Barbara McClintock? I, um, I would argue that she was one of the top 10 biologists of the 20th, 20th century. Um, she was doing experiments with corn plants in 1944, and she was... Um, she was trying to hack the, the genetics of a corn plant. And she would dose it with uh, small amounts of radiation with x-rays, which would break the chromosomes and introduce copying errors. And she would study what would happen when she would break certain chromosomes. And she had this idea of, of what was going to happen. And she sort of threw the plant a curveball. And the plant threw a curveball right back. Okay. So, so let me give you an analogy. So she damaged a chromosome, and now the DNA was broken, and it couldn't reproduce, and now what's the plant going to do? Well, to give you an analogy of what this plant did, it would be like if, um, uh, let's, let, let's say this is a, a Stephen King novel, okay? And let's say I opened up to page 183, and I ripped this page out, okay? And then I give it to a really good writer, like somebody, an English major, and I go, I want you to read everything before and after that page that I ripped out, and I want you to reconstruct what you think should be on that page, and I want you to fill it in. I want you to copy-paste other sentences and other paragraphs wherever and fix it so that nobody notices that this page was ripped out. Now, could a good writer probably do that? probably pull it off. Well, that's, that's what the corn plant did. The corn plant went to other chromosomes and copied stuff, put it over here, fixed itself, and went on and reproduced. And Barbara McClintock is like, whoa, what was that? And she spent the next seven years figuring out what happened. And she mapped it all out, which was quite a trick in 1940, 1950, because they didn't even know exactly what DNA was. But she was really good with a microscope. She was really, it was corn, so she's actually looking at the corn kernels. She's going, that kernel should have been yellow, it's brown. And that's because of that chromosome. She figured this all out. So in 1951, she goes and presents this to her colleagues at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. They thought she was crazy like woman. Plants don't re-engineer their genetics. You're supposed to know this. Okay, and half of them laughed at her and the other half were just mad. And nobody would take her seriously. So she went underground with her research for 20 years, but she kept doing it. But she won the Nobel Prize in 1983 for discovering transposition. And what she discovered was that organisms will rearrange um, transposable elements in their DNA. And those elements, they're like adverbs and adjectives that modify the meaning of certain genes, and that plants are capable of restructuring their own genetics, and they do it in real time. Another guy at the University of Chicago uh, named James Shapiro figured out that bacteria can also do this in 1968. Okay. This is actually going on in your body all the time, all right? So what this means is cells re-engineer themselves. Okay, now do you have any friends who are computer programmers who know how to write computer code that rewrites itself constantly on the fly? And if somebody goes and deletes part of it, it'll go fix it? 
Okay, there's, well, yeah, you, yeah, she said machine learning. Like, well, if they're programmed to do that by the smartest people in the world, yeah, you could get that, right? But it doesn't happen by accident, and that's the whole point. Okay, and so I, st I started realizing, hey, wait a minute. You know, this whole, this whole evolution thing, like, people of faith should not be thinking evolution is a four-letter word. Like, this is absolutely amazing. In fact, this is beyond what any humans actually know how to do. And so I traded what you would probably call old earth creationism for natural genetic engineering. This is why you have to finish your antibiotics. You ever go to the doctor, he's like, okay, you finish the bottle. Even if this, you know, even if your strep goes away, finish the bottle all the way done. Why? Because if, if you don't kill those bugs dead, dead, then a few of them will mutate and they'll turn into super bugs and now you've got a real serious problem. Be why? Because they evolve. They can evolve in 30 minutes by stealing bacteria from other organisms. Uh, stealing DNA, like one bacteria, find another one, steal its DNA, go, hey, here's a pump. I'm going to pump the poison out. And then all of a sudden, the antibiotic doesn't work anymore. Okay, so... So, people who are fighting evolution because they think that it's like somehow speaks of a random purposeless universe, uh, they don't understand how evolution really works. And so, I'll tell you an interesting little part about this. So, so I said, um, in, in 2005, how many of you are familiar with Willow Creek Community Church up in the northwest suburbs? Um, I used to go there back then, and I gave a talk at Willow Creek called, If You Can Read This, I Can Prove God Exists. And it was a little tongue-in-cheek, because you can't prove that God exists. But here was my article, argument. My argument was, you know, based on a guy who wrote an Ethernet book, uh, DNA is a code. There's a million codes, right? There's HTML and PHP and Java and Chinese and English, and they're, they're all designed by humans, right? There's a million codes. There's no codes that aren't designed that anybody knows of. And then you got this one code and nobody knows where it came from. It's called DNA. So the logical inference would be the DNA sure looks like it was designed. In fact, it looks a lot like Ethernet packets, which are designed by like really smart people. Um, and like this would never happen by accident. So there you go. There's my argument. And so uh, I give this talk, and, um, and I post a recording of my talk on my website, and it went viral. And it started making a lot of people upset, especially the atheists. And I started relishing <laughs> the opportunity to make atheists angry. And so, but what, then, then eventually what happened was I got in this discussion with a guy, and he got flustered. And um, so he goes over to this website here, infidels.org, which at the time was the largest atheist website and discussion board in the world. And he posted a post. Do you see that highlighted part? It says, proof of God via DNA and evolution. He posted that there. And he said, hey, you guys, been arguing with this guy, Perry Marshall. Here's a link to his talk. Uh, be really nice to him while you rip him to shreds. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. What did I get myself into? Well, I'll tell you what I got myself into. This went on for seven years. <laughs> okay? This is a screenshot from 2010. Okay? And it went on two more years after that. Okay, this became the longest running, most viewed thread in the history of the largest atheist website in the world at the time. Okay, and nobody could solve this. And I kept saying, show me a code that's not designed, all you need is one. <laughs> show me a code that's not designed, all you need is one. Never, never could solve it. But I had this frustration, so I mean... 
Uh, they eventually, this whole thread and board, the whole thing got shut down. It got sold to somebody else. There's a big long history. But anyway, you know, no, nobody really solved my challenge. But I still had this frustration. And, um, and the frustration is these arguments would go around and around in circles. They wouldn't accept the definitions and stuff like that. And one day, I had this crazy idea. It was like, Perry, um, tell the guy, write a spec, and tell the guy if, look, here's how you solve it. Here's how you prove me wrong. Here's how you get a code without designing one, and here's how you prove that it's a code. Here it is. If you can do this, I'll write you a check for 10 grand. And the argument just stopped. I was like, wow, that worked. I didn't think that would, I didn't know that would work. That worked, wow. Well, so then I started working on this book here. Uh, it's called Evolution 2.0, Breaking the Deadlock Between Darwin and Design. And it, I decided, well, we need something bigger than a $10,000 prize. We need like a real prize. Um, and my brother, the one that argued with me on the bus, he's watching all this with a great deal of interest. Now, at this point, he was definitely not an atheist, but he also wasn't a Christian either. He's sort of an agnostic. But he's watching my ping pong balls go back and forth, and he thinks it's really interesting. And he says, well, Perry, okay, that's really great. You know, you're a little rabbit foo-foo, and you cannot bonk the atheist on the head, and that's really good for you, and I'm happy for you and everything. But look, he goes... You know, it's not like a scientist can go, well, see, God did it, that settles it, let's go out to lunch. Like a scientist have to, has to publish a paper, a scientist has to figure this out. There's really merit to figure this out. So, like, you're not really helping science with your little challenge. And, um, and, and this began to change the way I started viewing this. I started viewing this like, well, what if somebody actually did solve this? So, what if somebody figured out how to take something like a tabletop and actually get it to produce code or pour chemicals in your bathtub and get code like would that be useful would that be kind of like ai okay like whatever gave birth to the first cell if you could figure it out and reproduce it do you think it might be useful to somebody i think it might be really useful i think it might be one of the top 10 scientific discoveries of the whole 21st century. And so I started thinking about this really seriously. Um, and so what I did was I traded a God of the gaps argument, which is, this is impossible, God must have did it, see, which is not, you know, I mean, there's, like, Notre Dame has famous philosophers like Plantinga and, like, you know, if you, they'll, they'll tell you, you know, you can use an argument like that if you want, but I don't think it's a really good idea because somebody always like discovers something and then knocks it over and then you're back to the drawing board with God again. Like God doesn't really work that way. And, and I said, I traded that for a decision and never sweep vital questions under the rug. And I said, where did life come from? That's a pretty important question. Like if we're like editing genomes and, 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 and doing, you know, uh, gene genetically modified foods and stuff, do you think it might be useful to know where life came from if we're going to do stuff like that. And so what I did was I put together a technology prize. And uh, I'm going to play a little video for you. How are your own thoughts different from a Google search? Google matches patterns, but it's unaware of you or itself. Our brains also match patterns, but our minds are aware of both ourselves and others. This awareness empowers us to make choices. Computers don't choose. They obey pre-made rules. Minds make and break the rules. Somehow, our minds bridge the gap between passive chemicals and creative code. If the origin of life on Earth is a valid science, then this must be possible. Earth somehow made the jump from chemicals to code. But how? Where did the first cell get its plan? And how do you get a code without designing one? It's time to find out. A private equity investment group known as Natural Code LLC has funded a technology prize to reward the first person who can solve origin of information. 
There is no industry that won't be impacted by this. There is no human being who won't enjoy its benefits. But it must be a real experiment. And it must produce a code with nobody having to design one. If you discover it and we can together patent it, you will receive a multi-million dollar financial reward. Your name will go down in history for having discovered a landmark of 21st century science and one of the most pivotal new technologies of our age. Apply your ingenuity and let's solve this. Together we'll develop it to its full potential and license it to the world. Follow this challenge and you'll get regular updates on our progress. So here's how the prize works. If you can produce a self-organizing digital code, we'll write you a check for $100,000. If your process is patentable, our company will pay for the patent process and we'll write you a check for $5 million US dollars and part, partner you in as a shareholder in the company. And then we'll go figure out, you know, are we going to license this? Are we going to sell it? What are we going to do? Um, I've got some judges. Uh, I needed some people uh, who were accomplished scientists to judge the work of any submissions that come in. One of my judges is George Church, who's from Harvard and MIT. He's the leading genomics guy at Harvard. And he's written 425 papers, 95 patents, very cutting edge genome research guy. Um, Dennis Noble is one of the top 100 scientists in the UK. He is the guy who figured out how the cardiac rhythm works, which makes pace pacemakers possible. Um, he's a fellow of the Royal Society. He has a commander of the British Empire designation from the Queen of England. And his heart research convinced him that the usual and customary explanation of evolution was completely wrong. And that, uh, that the evolutionary theory needed to have a reboot. And he organized a conference a year ago in London uh, that was very controversial. And he brought a lot of people into the limelight that had been ignored for a very long time. And, the, and, and evolutionary biology is in a massive state of of uh, revolution right now. Um, uh, one of my advisors told me, Perry, you need to get some atheists on your, uh, on your team. Because otherwise, somebody will think this is like a creationist Trojan horse. Because they know you come from Nebraska and you grew up, you know, you're a pastor's kid and stuff. So I got this guy, Michael Ruse from Florida State University. He's a professor of the philosophy and history of biology. He's an author of Darwinism, Design, Atheism, What Everyone Needs to Know, uh, and Science, Evolution, and Religion. He's, he's an atheist, and he's a very reasonable one, unlike certain other ones that most of us might be familiar with. And so this is my judging panel. Now, um, let's talk about evolution for a second, in a, and let's make this really practical since this is a business class. Many, many, many breakthroughs that Silicon Valley and Wall Street are seeking are already solved in the cell. And we just need to look in the microscope. And what I'm going to, so in my book Evolution 2.0, I describe evolution as running on five blades. That cells have a toolkit uh, with five different parts to it. Um, and uh, one of the blades is called symbiogenesis. And it's one of the most useful concepts. Uh, in, uh, in business or in biology, uh, and, and, and here, here's how it works. Um, how many of you knew I, uh, that lichen is actually just a merger of algae and fungus? It's actually what it is. So you go to a rock and you, you know, scratch off a little piece of lichen, that's actually a network of fungus threads with algae living in them. And it can live in places that neither fungus nor algae can live by themselves. And it's a, it's a cooperative partnership between the two organisms. Um, 
every time you look out your window and you see any green blade of grass or tree, anything that's green, the reason that it's green is because, now in, in high school biology, they said the thing that makes it green is what? Chlorophyll. Chlorophyll, which is made by a chloroplast, okay? Like, they, they taught you that. You know what a chloroplast is? It's algae. It's an algae cell living inside a plant cell. That's literally what it is. All the green stuff you ever see in your life is green because of algae. Okay? And so this picture illustrates it. Um, you had a cell and it ingested an algae and instead of digesting it, it said, hey, we could do something here. You know how to turn sunlight and carbon dioxide into energy, and I could use some of that stuff. So how about I give you a nice, safe place to live. I got this nice cell wall. We have food in the lobby. We've got laptops. We've got, we got Kleenex. Man, you just make your, here, why don't you just sit in this chair here? You make, you, you, you take some of that sunlight and carbon dioxide and turn it into energy, and we got ourselves a deal, okay? And the algae, it's got its own DNA. It reproduces, and it, 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 it becomes, it's a merger acquisition. In fact, a Starbucks in a Marriott is just like an algae in a plant cell, okay? So, like, you know, we think we invented merger acquisitions, like, Sometime recently? No, 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 no. Well, like two billion years ago. Okay. Um, this guy right here, he's a friend of mine. His name is Quan Jung. He's a emeritus professor from the University of Tennessee. He does this experiment where he took amoebas and X bacteria and he put them in a petri dish and they fought like cats and dogs for 18 months. And at the end, he had bacteria living inside the amoeba and they had formed a symbiotic partnership just like the algae and the plant cell and if you took them apart they would both die okay and that's the definition of symbiogenesis the definition of symbiogenesis is you have a merger acquisition and after it's completely integrated the functions are so shared between the two that if you took them apart, they'll fall apart. Okay? And nature is full of, of symbiotic relationships. You know what? Cell for cell, 90% of the cells in your body are bacteria and other organisms that live inside you, help you digest your food, live on your skin, fight off other bad germs. 90% cell for cell are symbiotic organisms living on you and in you. Uh, how many of you, either you or your kids, you give them antibiotics and all of a sudden the, the girl's got a yeast infection? Okay, it's because you killed the symbiotic bacteria and now other bac uh, enemy bacteria can come in and cause a, a wreak havoc. It's why, it's why you take probiotics. That's what they are, they're symbiotic bacteria, okay? This is one of the most important evolutionary relationships in all of nature, and it's the one that makes the biggest quantum leaps. In the whole Swiss Army knife with five blades, this is the one that gives you the quantum leaps. Most of the other ones are just incremental Kaizen, continuous improvement kind of things, but this is major leaps. And we're going we're gonna to do an exercise around this. So just to kind of give you a picture, this is how symbiotic relations typically work, is you got these, let's say they're algae, and you got this plant cell, and now you got algae living in plant cells, and what happens is the algae will get rid of some of their DNA, they'll give some of their DNA to the plant, the plant might give some of its DNA back to the algae, they'll rearrange their relationships, like, okay, so you do this, 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 and this, and I'll do this, 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 and this. We can get rid of, so like, when, um, you know, if Google acquires YouTube, do they still keep separate accounting departments? Um, 
Probably, well, do they keep all separate departments? No, they, they consolidate stuff, right? And like usually, you know, the most basic stuff goes to the home office, right? And only the, and this is exactly what cells do. And they do it in real time, right? So this guy, he got this to happen in 18 months. It didn't take 18 million years. It took 18 months. So this is an active process, okay? So, or you can have A and B and C. So you could have A and B living inside of C. You could even have B living inside of A inside of C. In fact, in your own body, there's probably six levels of cells inside of cells inside of cells inside of cells. It's crazy. Um, so here's the formula. X plus Y minus Z equals symbiosis. Now, the, the adding stuff together part, that's easy and obvious. It's the subtraction that's hard, right? How many of you have done merger acquisitions? This guy, did, like, isn't the subtraction kind of like, right? It's tricky. So let, let's, let's talk through this a little bit, and then we'll, uh, we'll do a little exercise. Okay. Restaurant plus automation plus drive through window minus no spaghetti, no burritos, no donuts, no baked potatoes, no steak, no carrots. That's McDonald's. And the key part of McDonald's, so everybody thinks about McDonald's as being, oh, yeah, they brought the assembly line into a restaurant. They brought automation into a restaurant. Yeah, they did. But what was important was what they subtracted. What was important was what they were not, okay? The first McDonald's had nine items on the menu. And, the, and early franchisers were like, hey, let's have fried chicken. Like, no, we're not doing fried chicken. We're McDonald's, right? That, you know, like, like go start your own restaurant and do fried chicken. Anybody see that recent uh, movie that came out? It was really good. A okay. lot of exaggerations in that movie, I feel like. Oh, I, I imagine so. I imagine so. It was, so, it was okay. Okay. Ryan's with McDonald's. Okay. Here's a, <laughs> well, I loved it. I, oh, well, the, the, next time, I want you to talk. Uh, you, you could give a whole talk on that movie, right? Okay. Classified ads plus search engine plus bid auction minus pictures minus banner ads equals Google. Okay, and not having that stuff was actually a key to building a relevant search engine, right? Airline, minus fancy meals in first class and, and getting rid of all possible planes except for 737s, that got you Southwest Airlines, right? Furniture plus Swedish design plus giant blue warehouse plus cafeteria minus the the big key to ikea was what they subtracted so the guy that started ikea he said he said okay if like it's the, it's the table legs that take up all the space if i if i sell a table if i make a table and i have to put it in a shipping container and ship it from sweden or china to the united states um like the ship in furniture, like 30 or 40% of the cost of furniture is just the shipping. He said, if I can force, if I can convince the customer to assemble it themselves, I can crunch this stuff down. I can put, you know, 100 tables in a shipping container instead of only putting 20 tables into a shipping container. And I can cut the price by like 40%. And then we can have the warehouse and the Swedish meatballs and all this kind of stuff. And it was the subtraction that actually made it work. So here's what I want you guys to do. I want you, you're in groups, okay, so you don't have to break it, uh, so that's great, okay. So I want you to choose the person with the most pressing business problem, okay. And I want you to pick another person who has the most eccentric background or field of knowledge, like Okay, so like this guy, Ken, he's working on a merger acquisition right now, and, and like, boy, you know, this could be really great or it could turn out really ugly, and let's say Melissa is an expert on um, uh, under, uh, orchids in Fiji or something, okay, whatever it might be, okay, 
and 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 I want I want you to take this other form of knowledge and you can you can try different people it doesn't you know but have somebody who has some outside form of knowledge that doesn't immediately appear to relate and I want you to do an X plus Y minus Z okay so he's doing an acquisition she's got orchids we're gonna okay I know this is crazy but but you know then we'll come back in in 15 minutes and let's see how this turns out okay nobody go anywhere nobody goes anywhere and and you know orchids plus merger acquisition minus something equals something interesting that we can do and I'll be available I can, I'll go around and I'll talk to y'all all you guys um, and I, I want you to take this really seriously I, I in my company I, I do this kind of thinking all the time a lot of times when I run into a problem I go okay how would mother nature solve this okay and and so all right, we got, let's call it 15 minutes, go.